Morning, folks. I'm Dave Canterbury with Self Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School, and I'm back down here at the Pathfinder Outdoor Classroom here in Southeast Ohio today with another segment in our Definitive Ground Camper series. We've talked about conduction. We've talked about convection. Now we need to speak a little bit to radiation and how we can control or manipulate radiation in our favor to take care of us in a ground camping scenario. So what we're going to do today is this will be a two-part video. We're going to do a classroom discussion first on part one. Now, part two, we're going to take, we're going to go out to the field and we may do a traditional camp on this last one and put all of this stuff together and discuss the radiation and do follow these best practices that we talk about on the board today with everything that we've went over so far from conduction to convection to radiation, set up a camp that's going to be nice and comfortable for an overnight and that will be the next part of this video. So first, let's talk about radiation and get a better understanding of the physics of radiation and how that works and how we can manipulate that in a camping environment, especially in colder weather. Okay, so there are three main topics of discussion here as far as radiant heat. The heat that's released through metabolism or metabolics of our body, which are BTUs. And we have covered that pretty well in a previous video as far as how many BTUs of heat our body releases at rest, while we're sleeping, partially awake, during exercise, during hard work, all those types of things we talked about. So things like our clothing, puffy jackets and layering systems and things like that will help us to trap that radiant heat and keep it from escaping our body so quickly. Things like scarves, things like hats. We talked about all of that in the clothing video. The next thing that we need to talk about is direct radiant heat. Direct radiant heat from the fire or from the sun. Those are things that we can somewhat manipulate as well within a camping environment, especially in a ground camping environment by the use of fire. We can only take advantage of the sun by putting our shelter in a certain direction, facing sunrise and things like that to help warm our shelter up in the morning. So we're kind of limited on what we can do with the sun in a cold weather environment. However, the radiant heat from a fire is a whole different ball game. And the mechanics of that are something we definitely need to understand. Thermal mass re-radiation is something that we need to understand because there's a lot of misinformation on the internet, on YouTube, and places like that when people talk about how camps are set up and how heat is moved, let's just say moved, for lack of a better word right now, from a fire to something else, okay? And we're going to discuss that in detail in this video. So thermal mass re-radiation. So these are going to be the three topics we'll talk about We've pretty much discussed the release of BTUs and heat through metabolic activity. So we'll skip over that one in this video because we've already discussed it. And we'll talk directly about radiant heat from the fire first. And then we'll talk about thermal mass re-radiation. Okay, when we build a fire, it produces radiant heat. That radiant heat basically travels in all directions. However, this direction of up and down basically is carried away by convection, okay? The heat that travels in a straight line that you can visually see is the heat that you can take advantage of and absorb. What you have to remember with this is two things that are very important. Number one, the type of wood you use can dictate the amount of BTUs per hour that fire can put out. So in simple terms, harder woods, more dense woods, are going to give you longer burn times and higher BTUs and more heat in general over time than softer woods. Softer woods are going to burn up faster. Those are kindling woods. Fuel woods should be hardwoods, okay? The next thing to understand with this is that the further we are away from the fire, the less heat we are able to absorb. If I'm standing from here to a pole in this building that we're underneath right now, and that pole is 12 feet away, and there's a small fire burning on the ground. I can see that fire, but I can't feel the heat from that fire. So the way that works is with what's called a rule of inverse squares, and it also works with re-radiated heat that we'll talk about in a few minutes, which basically means that at a given distance from the fire that you can feel heat. For every equal distance you step back away from that fire, you're going to get 25% of that heat that you felt from that position. So 25% one step back, 
25% of 25%, another step back, and that's called the rule of inverse squares. So basically, you're losing the ability to absorb that radiant heat the further you get from the fire. That's why most of the time when we discuss shelters and fires, we say one full step, that's the safe distance, but still gives you close enough distance that you can feel direct radiant heat from the fire and help absorb it into your body, okay? So those are things that we need to understand with radiant heat. The other thing we want to understand is that any heat or any flame that is above our head is going to go over our head. It pretty much travels in a straight line. So if we're laying on the ground in front of a fire, shelter is going to be thermal mass. We'll talk about that in a few minutes for a few minutes for re-radiation, okay? But for sake of our own body, if we're laying in front of a fire, any fire that's above where a body's laying is wasted radiant heat, okay? We're not going to absorb it because it's going to go right over top of us. It's a straight line situation for the most part, okay? So if you have, let's say you're laying in front of a fire and you've built your fire to warm your shelter at night, to warm you at night while you're inside your shelter, and you have a great big log sitting in front of you that you used to build some kind of a platform for a bed, okay? That heat's going to thermal, is going to heat that log. The radiant heat's going to heat that log. It's not going to heat your body directly because the log is blocking that radiant heat from hitting you. Now, anything you have above the log is going to be heated by the fire. But if your body's laying right there at the log level, you're going to be relying on a totally different type of heat to heat you up, not direct radiant heat, because the direct radiant heat is blocked by the log. So when you do that, you want to make sure that you get your bedding up above that log so that your body is above anything that would block that direct radiant heat from hitting your body, okay? That's an important thing to understand when we're building shelters because we always th think it's a good idea to put something in front of us, especially if we're using ground debris for bedding, and it is a good idea. But what you have to remember is that the larger in diameter that log that you use or blocker is in front of you, you're gonna need to get that bedding up higher and higher so that you're not laying behind that log blocking radiant heat from the fire, okay? That's an important thing to realize. Now, once we understand how radiant heat travels, once we understand that uh, rule of inverse squares and the further away we are, the less heat, that's pretty much a given. It's common sense to understand that. We grew up around fires and things like that. We know the further we step away, the less heat we feel. But it's just an important part of the physics of fire to understand when you're positioning that fire in front of your shelter, okay? So... Let's get rid of this makeshift uh, fire drawing I did here. And so really the only thing we can do with that radiant heat for our body directly is to be in line with the radiant heat waves that are coming off that fire, okay? Or the radiant heat that's directly coming off that fire in a straight line to us, that's going to warm us the best, okay? Now let's talk a little bit about thermal mass, okay, and how thermal mass works. What we want to talk about now is we want to talk about re-radiation and thermal mass. And I don't want to get really complicated with this. So I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple. Infrared radiation is what heats up an object. It's either deflected or it's absorbed, right? And what that means is that it's not reflected unless it is something that reflects radiant heat, like a mylar blanket, like a shiny surface, Something like that will reflect the heat. In other words, it hits it, bounces straight back. That's reflection, okay? Deflection or deflected heat is the amount of heat that transfers to an object that can't be absorbed, all right? That can deflect in multiple directions and be carried away with convection, all those types of things, but it's not going to be reflective heat. And that's the key element to understand there, okay? If it's not shiny, it's not reflecting. The factors involved in this are the color, the texture, and the type of material. All right, so color. Dark colors and matte surfaces absorb more than shiny surfaces or slick surfaces or light colors. Think about your car when you were a kid. Dark colored seats are going to be hot when you get them in the summertime. Light colored seats, not so much. Texture. Rough textures absorb more than polished textures do. Material. 
Dense material absorbs and stores more heat through thermal mass. We're going to talk more about thermal mass in just a minute, okay? But the denser the material is, the more it can store energy. Think about that when it comes to things like the difference between a log and a tarp, okay? All right, so here's a couple of key points. Absorbed radiation equals heat. When radiant heat hits an object, it's stored in that object and becomes heat, all right? The radiation is not heat. What happens with the radiation is it aggravates the molecules within the object that's hitting and causes heat to happen, okay? So when radiation and radiant heat from a fire hits a solid object, it heats it up as it absorbs that radiation. Energy stored becomes thermal mass. That's one of the key things that we need to understand is thermal mass because that's what a lot of people confuse with trapping heat or reflecting heat, all right? Thermal mass is absorbed heat, stored heat that releases slowly. That's thermal mass, all right? So things that make good thermal mass heaters are stone, brick, earth, water, and thick hardwoods. So nowhere on the list, list do you see oilskin tarp, canvas tarp, nylon tarp, poncho, because they're not effective thermal mass heating devices. They cannot store energy for long periods of time and release it slowly. So when you say you're trapping heat inside of a shelter, you're absolutely not trapping heat inside of a shelter. It is being absorbed into the fabric and gone that fast, okay? Because there's no thermal mass properties to that fabric. However, if you have a fire backer on the other side of your fire that's made of earth or made of logs or made of rock or stone, that's going to absorb radiant heat. It's going to hold that heat and it's going to release that heat over time, not reflect it, release that heat in all directions. It's going to release that heat over time. So even if the fire dies down and that backer of logs, thick, heavy logs or stone or earth or whatever you've got there has been heated up by the radiation of that fire, it's stored that energy and will release it slowly over time. It's the same thing as sleeping on a hot bed of coals buried underneath the earth or hot rocks underneath the earth that you're sleeping on top of. The thermal mass in those stones or in those coals is releasing heat slowly through the earth and up to your body because heat rises, okay? These things are important to understand when we're building shelters to realize that if we put a shelter in front of a fire that's made of a poncho, made of canvas, made of a silver nylon tarp, it is not doing anything for us as far as holding heat in that area. It's very, very minimal. Sooner or later, the radiation will just go right through it. It's not going to absorb it. It's not going to release the heat over time because there's not enough mass for it to do that, okay? So you are basically just capturing a little bit of warm air, for lack of a better word, that's not going to last very long. And the convection is really what's throwing heat into that area. But as soon as that fire dies down, that's gone, okay? You're not going to get any residual heat from that because it doesn't have enough thermal mass. That's very, very important to understand when we're building shelters and how to construct them. And when you're talking about fire backers that most people mistakenly call reflectors, you want to use material that has good thermal mass properties. Stone, earth, I wouldn't use water, obviously. Hardwoods, things like that. Those are going to have good thermal mass and release heat slowly over time. Those are the things you want to use, okay? So one note real quick before we move on when it comes to fire backers, okay? I see fire backers a lot on the internet in different posts on forums and things like that and different Facebook pages. I see them in videos and they're made with sticks this big around, you know, and they're this tall and they got sticks behind them and they're tied together and that's it, okay? That doesn't do a whole lot for you in all honesty because it's not a thick hardwood, right? It needs to be a hardwood, number one, which means it needs to be oak, hickory, things like that, all right? Those are hardwoods, not softwoods like pines, poplars, Tulip poplar, those type things are softwoods. You don't want that. You want hardwoods and you want them in large diameter. I would say six inches would be the minimum I would want for an actual fire backer, 
would be something in six inch log diameter would be the best bet for you if you expect to get heat off of it. Now, if you're using smaller diameter stuff because you don't have anything else, pile earth against it, right? In between the fire and the fire backer, put some earth in there. That way you're heating up that earth and it does have good thermal mass, okay? So there's all kinds of ways to manipulate this stuff. As long as you understand the physics and the principles of it, you can take advantage of it. All right. So really the last thing that we need to cover in this discussion real quick before we move on to part two of this and go out and do a field exercise is that re-radiation is subject to the same rule of inverse squares as actual fire or radiant heat in general. The further you are away from it, the less effective it's going to be. So you want to find that happy medium of where that fire is going to be, where that fire backer is going to be, what the material you're going to use in your shelter is going to be and mix those together along with our rules for conduction and convection to give yourself a good warm shelter in the wintertime. Guys, I appreciate your views. I appreciate your support. I thank you for everything you do for our school, for our family, for our business, for all of our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends, as well as our partners. And I'll be back with part two in this video in the series, The Definitive Ground Camper, as soon as I can. Thanks, guys.